Our next speaker is uh, Christina Vatulescu, one of the organizers of the panel. I'll say, uh, along with being a really fantastic uh, colleague, uh, Christina is uh, the author of Police Aesthetics, Literature, Film, and the Secret Police, which uh, received uh, several major prizes, among which won the Helt Prize in 2011. Um, she has worked on a wide range of topics, uh, not only on Russian and uh, Romanian film, but also recently on uh, Abbas Kirostami's close-up in her article, The Face-to-Face -face Encounter of Art and Law. And today, her paper is Multimedia in the Archives of Film, Two Photo Albums, and 27 Files. Christina, please. So on July 28, 1959, the Romanian National Bank was robbed in broad morning daylight by masked individuals carrying guns. At this time and place, the bank heist seemed out of the movies. Even though Stalin had been dead for six years, in Romania, the Stalinization had not yet arrived. And Romania was a police state. Within just a few months after the bank heist, six suspects were caught, judged, and sentenced. All sentences were speedily carried out. Five men were shot, and the one woman was shipped to a women's prison but not before all six prisoners were made to participate in a feature-length film reenacting their crime. The film reenactment or reconstruction, depending on the translation, Reconstituira in Romanian, called itself a collaboration between the secret police and the state documentary film studio, Sahia. The secret police provided the protagonist, the suspect, and the investigators as well as the extras. For one scene, a central part of the city was temporarily evacuated and filled with over 100 secret police agents. The film studio then provided the equipment and the know-how in the person of some of its leading names. Now, whenever I tell this story to audiences that are not kind of immobilized in their seats as you are now by the conventions of academic talks, I can't get further than here before I'm asked why on earth did they make such a movie? <laughs> why did the secret police make a film in collaboration with a documentary film studio? Why did they choose to stage a reenactment featuring the suspects? And why did the suspects agree? Last but not least, why would a secret police agency agree to parade not only its suspects, but also its secret agents in front of documentary film cameras. Before addressing these particular questions, it is worth facing the larger dilemma that could put them all to rest. Why watch such a film now? Part of the answer is that we are confronted with it as part of the second wave, the visual wave, of the truly momentous, if still partial, opening of the secret police archives in Eastern Europe. In the last few years, the long ignored visual component of these and other Eastern European archives has started to emerge, photographs and films that we are only starting to grapple with. We have no comprehensive view of these films, often no finding aids and no projection capacities. So at least for now, we need to proceed one movie at a time. The case file that I bring for your consideration today, the 1959-1960 robbery of the Romanian National Bank, is the most instructive multimedia artifact that I have seen so far. First, there is the film. While deeply rooted in the Soviet documentary trans tradition with self-conscious citations from Vyartov's Mian with the movie camera, for example, the film reenactment deserves our attention as it represents a new fulcrum point in the long history of the collaboration between cinema and the police, as well as a powerful self-conscious articulation of the relationship between word and image, documentary and fiction film, film subjects and closely watched audiences. Through its analysis alongside the print files, which also include two albums of production stills and other photographs, I want to start broaching questions about potential strategies to approach the filmic and photographic holdings of the secret police archives and their relationship to the textual holdings that at this point we know more about. So you may say any archive is multimedia, or at least it can be, and of course that's true. That's why I think 
this is a relevant topic. Um, yet the secret police archives are particularly multimedia. They are multimedia on steroids, as it were, because of a particular quirk. In these archives, the standard preservation requirements that ask that photographs or sketches or other visual materials be kept separately from print to ensure their survival through time were overridden for forensic, for the, by the forensic need to have words and images in one place, the case file. As a result, original photographs were crudely glued on the page of case files, often written over. X-rays, as you saw, were loosely attached with paper clips, envelopes of family photos routinely spill out of their aged envelopes before unsuspecting perusals. The materiality of various media that comprise many a file is visible and palpable even upon a first browsing. Now let's go to the film itself, starting with its very beginning. This is the only clip I'm gonna show you. Fiecare epocă, fiecare veac, și-a avut cronicarii săi care au însemnat în letopisețe evenimele cele mai de seamă. Și dacă în istoria poporului nostru sunt fapte care pot fi tălmăcite sau se pierd în negura vremurilor, cele de azi, reținute cu ochiul acesta, memorate de acest scrib automat și gravate pe această filă de hrisov modern, nu mai pot fi puse de nimeni sub semnul întrebării că cele rămân întipărite prin imagini vii, identice cu realitatea. Era pe la sfârșitul anului 1959, când am consemnat în paginile cronicii noastre cinematografice acest caz. So the secret police cinematic Ars Poetica, that starts by loudly proclaiming the end of the written word, and the reign of the cinematic image proceeds with the image of a collection of words, a secret police file. This file lies ceremoniously on a table in front of a military judge who starts browsing through it in a tantalizing gesture for the audience positioned to look over his shoulder. But no matter how much the spectator strains her vision to focus on the out-of-focus letters, the text of the files remains illegible, and then, through a cinematic trick, the name of the movie, Reconstituira, is superimposed on it in bold letters. The film is thus posited as the illustration of this authoritative text. Rather than presenting the results of a zero-sum game between word and image, Reenactment allows us a carefully framed glimpse of the authoritative text that scripts the image. Yet the text, the secret police file, is itself carefully framed as an illegible image. This is a common way of representing the secret police file, initiated by Vertov, actually. Um, his representation of the first show trial in 1922, and repeated, for example, in three different scenes in the movie Salafki in 1928. The audience is shown the file covers, which are then open to reveal the interior of the file. To increase the tease, file pages can even appear in extreme close-up. However, the browsing and filming the files made sure that the pages were turned quickly enough to become illegible or that the resulting image was out of focus. The secret police file did not then simply revert the supremacy loudly trumpeted in Reconstruction's first sequence of the cinematic image over words. Nor is it just a collection of words. Instead, the file built and preserved its power as a canny concoction of words, images, and above all, particular practices of writing, copying, collating, reading, exhibiting, and weaving words and images in ways designed to capture the gaze of the audience while denying any real possibility of reading. The movie then begins with a cinematic trick that superimposes the credits of the film on the binders of the secret police files of the bank heist case, seeming to proclaim a relationship of seamless equivalence. They suggest that the film and the files are either interchangeable or that the film is at least contained in the binders of the file with the credits framed as they are by two shots of the files. Indeed, the superimposition change 
suggest that the film could be an adaptation of the secret police files. One of the questions that we will track today then is how does one adapt a secret police file in the medium of film? The source of the film's carefully crafted authority is revealed in this opening scene to lie in its superseding old history books and in the collusion of the new documentary film image with the files that scripted it. What my analysis does then is to play these words and images against themselves and each other to uncover that collusion. I analyze the film against the four evolving scripts contained in the file and against the two volumes of production stills. My analysis allows glimpses of other discarded, suppressed, or marginalized stories in the early discarded scripts, in surveillance transcripts, and cellmate informer reports, as well as in the scenarios, rumors, and other symptomatic and fragmentary stories that were trimmed in the final script of the movie. Furthermore, I draw attention to the film's seamless weaving of forensic and aesthetic devices such as interpolation, identification, the search for the close-up, and reenactment. This kind of analysis takes a lot of time and many pages. My chapter now runs at 70 pages, so what I did for today was to pick and choose a few moments when analyzing the different parts of the case files against each other produces enough friction to unsettle the carefully choreographed collusion between words and images that you saw in the opening clip, a collusion that defines the overpowering relationship between the media and the film and in the case files. So I'm about to slow down and closely analyze a few of the production stills in relationship to the film, but before I do that, here's a quicker look at some of the findings afforded by this methodology. So we're gonna quickly look at the file itself, and this is its first uh, volume. Comparing the four evolving scripts contained in the file with the finished movie reveals the gradual sublimation of a strong original driving force of the scripts, the anti-Semitic narrative that pitted the six Jewish suspects against the Romanian people from an explicit narrative blasted by the voiceover to a more subtly visually and orally embedded narrative which relied on the presence of the actual suspects and on the reenacted bank heist absent in the first version of the script. Um, secondly, the difficulty of proving the use of torture in communist and other camps, especially 50 or more years after its perpetration, is a real ethical as well as legal and political problem. Because of space constraints, I will give you just one example to show how the various narratives and gaping holes and question marks in these files were forcefully streamlined into a suspectly linear and homogeneous interrogation record. After undergoing torture, Monica Seviano returned to her cell swearing that, quote, no matter how many times they will torture her, she will not divulge any secrets, end of quote. Then she went on to divulge these very secrets to her cellmate, who immediately reported them to the investigator in her cellmate denunciation report. Thus we find out that on the 23rd of September, quote, as a consequence of the second physical correction, this is the euphemism for torture, applied to her, Monica Seviano returned to her cell with the definite intention of committing suicide as soon as possible. She was very tired and disconcerted, desiring death as a liberation. The interrogation record from the 23rd of September is as deceivingly bland as another, and you have the quote there. The cellmate reports were instrumental in producing the confessions recorded in the interrogation files, but they also present us with, the, with alternative views of the interrogation, such as this rare proof of the matter of course use of torture during interrogations, a piece of rare evidence within the secret police files themselves. So I thought I would frame the discussion of the photo albums as a bridge between the lecture and the Q&A to some extent 
as a way of illustrating my conclusions, but also as a way of opening up the conversation. I saw these photo albums in the archive two years ago, but I only received copies a month ago, years after I received copies of the textual part of the files, as if these most choreographed, hand-picked images of the film made for public viewing were the m most sensitive to declassify, more sensitive than all the written texts, including the cellmate informer revelations of torture, the, interrogator rec the interrogation records, or the movie's anti-Semitic script. Maybe the present day holders of the former Securitate archives intuitively know something about Walter Benjamin's concept of photography's optical unconscious, the idea that the photograph always captures more than the photographer meant to capture. So I'm very excited to share these photographs with you because they are the freshest part of my research project and they're the medium that I know least about, so I'm happy to get feedback. Now, to a certain extent, you may think that if my point was that the film is so tightly controlled and shaped by the secret police, its production stills would only be more so. After all, carefully selected, annotated production stills placed in a linear narrative in an album, in fact, in two identical ones, would only further freeze the narrative that I was so at pains in trying to pry open with the help of juxtaposing various versions of archival materials the different script drafts, the interrogation files, and the cellmate reports, or file marginalia. The production stills do offer the iconic moments of the film from the perspective of the secret police, what they wanted to remember, what they felt was important to remember. So these are just some images, and I'm gonna stop and closely analyze some, but I wanted to give you a feel for browsing the file. And there are two file volumes, and they are exactly the same. It's just one is a copy of the other. The other has the original photographs. And indeed, one of the main visual narratives of the film that I um, identify in my larger film analysis its quest for visibility and obsession with masks and unmasking, for example, is there in the photos as well. So you see here um, the masks, um, the obsession, the, this whole na narrative of visual narrative of masks and unmasking here, Sasha Mushat is putting on a mask, a false mustache, masks, okay. I'll stay there for a second. There's also um, the whole question of identification. So at first we see suspects in the film in long shot or through bag shot. And as the film progresses, we get closer and closer to them. Um, and it, the film ends with, um, with close-ups. So you see this kind of long shot. It's hard to identify them. They're masked. You don't see their faces and then the film ends in this triumphant um, close-ups in the tribunal. So the same, the same kind of narrative, this na narrative of identification, uh, the drive for the close-up, and this narrative of masking exists in, um, is, is picked up by, um, by the production stills as well. For example, after the first page of the album, um, shows the suspect in long shot and with their backs to the camera, thus challenging identification. The next page, so this is the first page, shows two photographs. It shows on the same page this one. We, we, you have them in long shot and the back shot. The next page masterfully introduces the idea of masking. Captioned, you are need with false mustache together with Monica Seviano at their surveillance po post the photo shows the two suspects ostensibly looking at each other. Besides the false mustache that the caption makes sure the viewer does not miss, there are also Ioannid's sunglasses, another disguise that he had used earlier, peeking out of his chest pocket. Monica Seviano's face is not masked, but it's turned in a three-quarter pose so we cannot see it too well. Instead, the eye is captured by the very striking 
um, an uncanny mask whose face is fully exposed. Adding to the uncanny effect of the mask is the position of the two protagonists. While they are ostensibly turned to each other in studied stiff three-quarter poses, their gazes, if you look carefully, don't in fact intersect, um, such that following the trajectory of their gazes um, does not lead to each other or to a common point in their midst, but rather past each other. This is again, again explained by the caption. They are there on surveillance. So they are looking not at each other, but rather they are surveying what is behind the other person. The composition of the picture reinforces the caption's message in a masterful way, as all lines move the vision centrifugally, creating a real tension with the ostensible orientation of the suspect's bodies. Thus, the mask and the crotch in the window uh, point to the left, while the angle of the street sign points to the right. In the middle, the striking black and white metal grid work of the locked door behind the character further thematizes the crisscrossing of their lines of vision. One must admit the secret police hired competent photographers just as they hired competent filmmakers who caught on the visual drama of the case in terms that the secret police favored, such as masking and unmasking, acting, identification, and surveillance. But the photo album also contains this image, my absolute favorite. What do you notice? The change in, and what he's wearing. What else? Yoshif looking in the margins. It is a camera. It is a camera. It is a camera and somebody's three subjects are looking and how, how and look at their poses, highly artificial poses, and then look at the next picture. <laughs> looking at the camera and looking away from the camera, right? In a world where the official image and the text were so airbrushed, the challenge of the potential of the archive is that it sometimes contains, if not the truth, but the words and images that were tried out, used, and discarded in the creation of the airbrushed record, or left there by mistake or oversight. This badly framed picture is so satisfying because it reveals a secret that the film had worked so hard to hide after that initial show of self-reflexivity when the movie opens on a movie camera, which then disappears, leaving us with images of live reality. The photo takes apart the fantasy of the unmediated and uncoerced film, revealing both the camera and the armed agent as the usually metaphorical, but here very literal, pair they formed. The archive sometimes holds such highly satisfying artifacts, but what it holds more often are masses of less inspiring artifacts of various media that can be played along and against each other as the context for a particular artifact in need of being estranged. The archive also can hold the various series out of which a best shot has been selected. The series can suggest different narratives than the one of the selected shot or a whole movie like Reconstruction. For example, the series of two photos with the suspects looking at the camera and then looking away from the camera testifies to the way their gazes were choreographed with the address to the camera spectator being edited out from the movie. Similarly to the ways in which I was proposing strategies of reading across file genres, such as interrogation reports and denunciation reports, or paying attention to repetitions and variations of the movie script drafts, we can try to think of further strategies of reading the photographs along and against the grain of the film and the text. The short analysis of the production stills today so far has suggested a few strategies, such as reframing in a particular way the traces process, tracking the cuttings of the airbrushed record, looking in the out-of-focus margins rather than in the focused center. 
I think I may have also missed these overlooked details in the kind of perusing that Faust measured in kilometers Nambu to performing had I not spent the previous day at the Bucharest National Museum for Contemporary Art, featuring then a mind-opening retrospective of Subreal, the art group formed by Josef Kirali and Colleen Dunn that had since the 1990s engaged in a series of artistic projects such as the Art History Project, meant to exploit the oppressive fascination of data, this is a quote, uh, and to play with the magic and authority surrounding the archives, end of quote. The root of their project was a discarded archive measured in kilograms, 600 kilograms of photographs and negative films, comprising the archive of the magazine Arta. The artists commented that what saved the images from being insipid reproduction of artworks was their generously wrong framing. The photographed art turned out to be just a centered detail, while around it emerged people, gestures, objects meant to have been edited out of the final image. Quote, quote from uh, Josef Kirali um, and Colleen Dunn. Cropping was the standard procedure for cleaning the surrounding mess in the pre-printing phase, end of quote. The artist then decided that their part, or let mo less modestly put their art, was, quote, to do a counter-cropping and edit the negatives like movies by cutting the predictable parts and enlarging the messy details, end of quote. Besides counter-cropping and cinematic enlarging of details, the two reenactment images I showed you before, these, suggest that another strategy could be paying attention to the ways in which, paradoxically for a still image, the photograph introduces a different sequence to the image on screen, recontextualizing it as part of a different narrative. Other strategies gleaned from artists' engagement with the material in the Securitate archive in another exhibit held in Romania that Josef Kirali was involved in, Second Life in Communism. This is, so, this is uh, serving art, which Josef will talk at length today, so this is kind of a plug for our next panel, um, where Josef will talk about this exhibit. And so what they do is they cut out the, the extraneous details. And this is another exhibit that Josef was uh, involved in called Second Life in Communism. Um, so other strategies uh, gleaned from um, this exhibit, Second Life in Communism, are recontextualizing by bringing in other images, new, like Google views and maps, or period images and objects, like surve surveillance manuals, maps, frames, and postcards. Related strategies involve abstract, abstracting, marking, and indexing the image, as well as reframing or retouching it. I'm about to finish. In parallel archives, uh, in this image, Bogdan Bordeano, Simona Dimit Dimitriou, and Josef Kirali juxtapose a found archive of 1970s and 80s postcards and surveillance pictures from that period. I remember being surprised and just a bit critical, this is just so people don't think that I'm a total groupie, Josef, <laughs> at the fact that the artist picked a found archive of postcards to juxtapose with the Securitate images, because postcards intercepted by mail sensors before getting to their destination actually abound in Securitate archives. Their blue skies constant, constantly interrupt the gray of the files. So I thought that the 70s and 80s postcard archive was unnecessary. The secret police archives have those holdings already. Based on this, I would say that the files already contain not just the second life of communism, in fact, they contain many lives in communism. They contain them in very particular ways, hierarchical and incriminating, even silencing them. But as historians of private life recently comment commented, they contain more of the intimate and the personal, in personal diaries, for example, that the police had a special soft spot for. Um, 
than most other archives. They also contain more of the deviant and more of the courageous, of the boring, of the non-event, as of the eventful. They even contain the juxtapositions, the collage effect of the colorful postcards with the black and white photos. It's all in there. It's just that most of the time we don't see the juxtapositions and the many different archives embedded in the secret police archive because the overarching structure of the archive does its best to muffle heteroglossia. Projects like Parallel Archives or the Art History Archive help us see, they retrain our vision and attention so that we can let ourselves see not just new juxtapositions, but also what was always already there, which sometimes means letting ourselves be distracted from reading to watch in other ways. This does not, this does not always come easily, especially if reading is what one has been trained to do and what one meant to do in the archive in the first place or when the cases are so convoluted and one is trying to follow the plot, to decipher the plot, the acronyms and the pseudonyms, who betrayed whom and for what reason. However, reading for the plot is problematic here, as it often requires participation in the logic of the writer and thus a complicity in the way things end up, which is most often dismally. So this is where I found artistic meditations and practices around archives truly inspirational, while I'm still fully committed to also close read a file that I had been commanded to watch like an illegible image. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. That was uh, fascinating. I um, have a quick and simple question. I noticed that you translated the Romanian word, what is it, reconstituera? Yes. Once as reenactment and once as reconstitution. Right. Does that make a difference? That's a great question. Yes, I think it makes a difference. And I'm writing now. In the beginning, I was translating it as reconstituire. And uh, now I'm translating it more and more as reenactment. Because I believe that uh, the acting part is actually really important. That um, part of what I do in um, in the bits of the paper that you didn't see is follow up on the reception of the movie. And the reception of the movie has a lot to do with how the audience perceived the bodies um, of the suspects on screen being emaciated and reacted to that and, and perceiving the way they acted. So that's how I changed from Reconstituida, which is uh, reconstitution, which is a kind of the police term, it's kind of a forensic term, to reenactment, which, which kind of emphasizes more the theatricality of, um, of the event, I guess. Right, reconstituir also can be a, an intellectual exercise, whereas reenactment has to happen with people, with bodies, in a room. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the film's circulation and reception, and also just to clarify, they, the suspects were forced to make the film after they'd already been tortured, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so um, there was a, a lot of mystery around the film's circulation and reception. And what I've been able to gather um, in, a, in my biggest kind of archive luck uh, moment, actually while visiting Oksana at CEU, so while doing research in a completely different archive for different reasons, I found in the Radio Free Europe Fund that Radio Free Europe was had its own um, network of informants who are trying to figure out what was happening in Eastern Europe. And their reports look quite similar to the Securitate reports. So I started doing research in, in those archives. And um, I found that I found all sorts of uh, reports of the gossips 
the gossip, the rumors that were going around this very mysterious case. And my favorite, there, there are quite a few, but my favorite um, was this Secret Police driver recounted to the informant that people believe that the way this bank heist happened, which seemed so out of the movies, was that um, the five men and woman pretended that they were shooting a movie and showed up there not only with guns but with cameras mm -hmm. and filmed, started filming and fooled the, the bank employees into believing that they were part of the movie. So they used their cameras and not their guns um, and filmed the whole thing and left with the money. Yeah, so it seems that what happened is that the memory of the actual bank heist and the memory of the reenactment of the bank heist somehow got conflated. Um, but kind of, but I'm very interested in these rumors and, and the gossip from the point of view of what's being called the weapons of the oppressed and uh, from the point of view of, of discourses that circulate that are symptomatic of what cannot be said in a culture. Um, so basically what happened, they made this movie and they were very interested in showing it to the large public, but before doing that they decided to run it to an audience of party members and journalists. Um, just to see how it goes. And we have, I found reports in Budapest that people didn't, that, that people left the cinema smiling um, as if uh, they knew that the truth was different from what they had been presenting on screen. And the secret police censored itself in front of that smile. So I find this very interesting, this kind of act of self-censorship in front of the audience reaction. But I find the audience reaction itself quite problematic, you know, there is not, and it explains like why were they smiling? Well, because they saw the emaciated bodies of the, of the you know, and, and my sense is that there's not that much to smile if you look at the bodies. They were looking through the bodies and kind of communicating with the secret police, oh, you're not fooling me, but in this way that actually sees through the bodies of the detained. Um, so, yeah, it has, and then so they censored themselves and they, they, they closed it up, but, I, but people knew about it and they knew about this film and there were these rumors and one way that I take this short presentation is that I argue that it's this kind of repressed origin for Romanian cinema because probably the most famous Romanian movie of the 60s is also called Reenactment. And it's about how the reenactment itself is the crime. It's during the reenactment that the death happens. Um, so, yeah, that was a long answer. In the beginning of your presentation, you referenced um, the secret police archives where the, record, the paper records had been paired with the photographs and that the suggestion to separate the two had been overwritten. What is the current state of that? Have they been separated? So in Romania, they haven't been separated. The photographs exist in the files. And I heard from one of my graduate students who's worked in the Stasi archives, that there they started separating them to sometimes rather ridiculous results in the sense that, you know, how do you, how do you catalog an image? It's always a, a problem, you know? How do you catalog an image? And so they have files with things that say sheep, you know? <laughs> and then there are many images of sheep that are now kind of taken from their original file. So it's, it's kind of a big open question of what should be done because in some ways these images do make sense in, in the context. Exactly, but they, they worry, yes, they just worry that for preservation reasons that the photographic paper will perish while being kept in the paper archives. I mean, you know more about what needs to be done in order to preserve a photograph. Yeah, I wonder, it's interesting that they don't have the negatives. Nobody knows about right. the negatives. I mean, yeah. I'm only in this uh, uh, files with small photographs on the reports. But I don't know if it's I mean, 
we have records of destructions. For example, the first line in this file is all the films should be destroyed. When I saw that, when I opened the file, my heart sank. And it turns out the film is, is kept in the Romanian um, film archive, but it's not kept in the secret police archive. They destroyed a lot and they filmed all the trial proceedings. Oh, and the, yes, I know. I'm saying also the, the negative of photo, of photographs, but they also destroyed a lot of film films. For example, they recorded the whole trial, which went on for 20 days, and they have records of destroying that. The last question, please, John. Wait. Yes. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's a fantastic talk, Christina. Uh, just a couple things. One thing about Vierta, the whole right SR trial and so on. There actually was a tradition of trial films, not just in Russia, and, but in the February Revolution, there was one whole newsreel that was devoted to the trial of General Sukhumlinov, and they showed photographs from the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung and so forth. The Bayless trial, there was also stuff where they would include documentation. I mean, it's a journalistic tradition, mm -hmm. right, that comes out of journalism. So this is not, it, that, that's important, I think, to keep in mind when one considers the originality or not of Vyartov in doing this, right? I mean, he's totally aware of this. I mean, you had newspapers, pre-revolutionary, not just in Russia, of course, so that's, that's just one small thing. But also, I guess, I'm thinking about the, the other background or sort of the other archives here because, I mean, also thinking about the date of this film, the late 50s, this is, of course, the great period of the police procedural uh, worldwide, not just in the United States. And that was the sequence you showed just sounded, seems so much like police procedural tropes. I don't know how aware Romanian filmmakers were of this and so on, but this idea of including, not only including consultants in the making of the film, images of police files, letters, evidence, all the rest of it, even extending sometimes into the incorporation of, I've never heard of anything as extreme. See, that's the thing that's incredible here is you have the actual tortured victims of this actually, uh, the suspects in the film, but for instance, um, the Phoenix City story, I don't know if you've ever seen that film, it actually, the, the, the guy, the main victim of that film is clothed supposedly in the, in, the, in, the, in the clothes of a guy who was murdered. This was one of the sort of selling points. I know it's totally gross. Um, I mean, you get other, I mean, almost as bad though, I mean, a much more famous film, Best Years of Our Lives, Harold Russell, who won an Academy Award for the role, was not an actor. He was a war amputee in the film, playing a war amputee and subjected to, I mean, if you know the film, it's extremely cruel, actually, what is seen in that film. So you have that kind of, so he's not playing himself exactly, but there is that sort of tradition, especially, I guess, in American film, um, of that kind of blurring, uh, sort of the, the protagonist sort of hanging between reality and fiction. Um, but the police procedural tropes seem to me to be may be relevant, but again, are they? I mean, I don't know. I mean, how aware are they of this sort of stuff? Uh, again, it was just, but like this was literally just all over the radio, TV, films, and so forth during this period. It's like kind of, it was just really popular material in, in a lot of countries. So I don't know if you have anything to say about it. I think, I think it is very relevant, and they do use film style knowingly. For example, they use kind of a noir aesthetic when they present the criminals and they keep saying that, they, that the criminal used the methods of um, American gangsters picked up where other than in noir films, you know? Whereas when they show the Romanian policeman that noir aesthetic disappears and you have like socialist realist style. So they totally use film style very knowingly and they quote from uh, yeah, from procedural, from noir, from. Yeah, these these guys, the, 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 the filmmakers that they use were, were you know, the Virgil Calotescu. He was a very savvy guy, and the cinematographer who who um, did this became Ceausescu's personal cinematographer. 